Beta decays are spontaneous radioactive decay processes in which inside a nucleus either a neutron gets converted to a proton or a proton gets converted to a neutron and in that process either an electron is emitted or a positron is emitted respectively. Now why does this kind of a reaction happen in the first place? This is because in nature most of the nuclei which are stable have a certain balance of number of neutrons and number of protons. This sort of a balance is shown by the NZ graph. Whenever this balance is disturbed and whenever there is an excess number of neutrons or an excess number of protons then the particle which is in excess usually gets converted to the other kind of particle. To show this we have a very simple example here. So whenever boron 12 is created in some sort of a nuclear reaction it immediately undergoes radioactive decay to form carbon 12 and leads to the emission of an electron in the process. What is happening is inside the boron 12 nucleus a neutron gets converted to a proton and thereby change the elemental nature of the nucleus itself. We can understand why such a decay happens by looking at the nuclear energy configuration of both these two nuclei. So in boron 12 you have five protons and seven neutrons while in carbon 12 you have six protons and six neutrons. Now because neutrons and protons are fermions so no more than two of the same kind of fermion can occupy a given energy level. So basically we end up getting this kind of a energy level diagram for both these two nuclei. Because there are two neutrons which are in excess inside the boron 12 nucleus, you can see here that the nucleus which is occupying the highest energy level, which is this nucleus, is occupying an energy level which is greater than the energy level of the highest proton. So the neutron is occupying the first, second, third, fourth energy level while the highest occupying proton is occupying the first, second, third energy level. So the neutron is occupying an energy level which is greater than the highest occupying proton and there is also a vacancy in the highest proton energy level. So if somehow this neutron gets converted to a proton, then this new proton will occupy an energy level which is lesser than the neutron energy level thereby decreasing the overall energy configuration thus we end up getting a carbon 12 which has less energy and more stability. So this is what happens in the beta decay process whenever a neutron or a proton is occupying a higher energy level because they are in excess they might get converted to the other kind of a particle thereby decreasing the overall energy of the system and increasing the stability of the nuclear configuration. This is why beta decay reactions happen in the first place. Now before talking about the different kinds of uh, beta decay processes which are seen in nature we need to discuss a very interesting and a very uh, important historical development which is associated with the beta decay process which has to do with the prediction of a very new fundamental elementary particle. This is known as the neutrino hypothesis. So studying the experimental aspects of beta decay led scientists to predict a completely new fundamental elementary particle, how it happened. So it happened by looking at the seemingly violation of certain kinds of physical laws which were taking place in the beta decay reaction. So if you look at the kinetic energy of an electron, it was found that theoretically we can calculate the kinetic energy of an electron by looking at the disintegration energy which is associated with a given nuclear reaction. So whenever a nuclear reaction takes place, some amount of energy is released. We can predict the energy released by looking at the mass defect and from that energy we can also predict the kinetic energy of the emitted particle because and then the outer nuclei is so massive the vast amount of disintegration energy is carried off by the electron in the form of kinetic energy. So we can theoretically predict the kinetic energy of the electron. However experimentally when the kinetic energy of the electron was studied it was found that the kinetic energy of the electron had a continuous distribution. We can look at this from the specific graph. So this graph here basically tells us the energy distribution of the electrons when we study a same nuclear reaction over and over again. So the x-axis represents the kinetic energy of the electrons and the y-axis represents the relative probability of the electrons. So if you study the same nuclear reaction over and over and over again, then the electrons seem to have kinetic energy which is not fixed but rather it has a continuous distribution. In some cases the electrons are seen to have zero kinetic energy 
energy. In some cases, a very rare cases, the electron is seen to have maximum kinetic energy. But for most of the cases, the electrons fell in a continuous distribution. Now, beta decay reactions, just like alpha decay reactions, are monokinetic in nature. That means the kinetic energy of the emitted particle should have a fixed value which can be theoretically calculated and in our case the beta decay should emit a kinetic energy of an alpha particle which is this so this is the expected kinetic energy based upon theoretical calculations so this is the expected kinetic energy of the electron however the experimentally observed kinetic energies fell in a continuous range so let's suppose that you perform a nuclear reaction and then you look at the energy of the electron which is emitted and you find that maybe Maybe the energy of the electron emitted lies somewhere let's suppose here all right if this is the case so this is basically the energy of the electron which is experimentally observed in your case then what happened to the rest of this energy so where is the rest of the energy gone so this is a basically a very puzzling aspect when you look at the experimental data that some of the energy is missing so where did this missing energy go? There was no explanation. In fact, this kind of a data was so much puzzling that the very famous scientist Niels Bohr, who gave the Bohr model of atom, suggested that maybe the beta decay is violating the conservation law of energy. And not just this, even the conservation of momentum was seemingly violated in this process. So if you look at the directions in which these particles are being emitted. So let's suppose that you have a boron 12 before undergoing radioactive decay process and suddenly this boron 12 undergoes a radioactive decay process. Then now suddenly you have an electron which is emitted in this kind of a process and a recoiling daughter nuclei which is the carbon 12. When you study the directions in which these particles are emitted, then it is seen that the electron is emitted in a direction which is not exactly opposite to the recoil of the daughter nuclei. This is confusing because if there are two particles which are involved, then conservation of linear momentum tells us that the recoiling particle and the emitted electron should move exactly in opposite directions to conserve linear momentum. This short of a, a recoil does not conserve linear momentum. So it was even suggested that maybe the beta decay was violating the conservation of momentum principle. It did not stop here. There is a discrepancy when you also look at the spin of the particles involved. When you look at the particles which are involved here, so in this case you have a neutron which is uh, becoming a proton and also leading to the emission of an electron in the first place, these particles are all fermions. That means a neutron has a spin of half, proton also has a spin of half and electron also has a spin of half. This is violating the conservation of spin angular momentum. Why? Because one spin half particle cannot lead to the creation of two spin half particles. The spin in the left hand side and the right hand side are not balanced and because spin directly relates to the spin angular momentum of those particles, the angular momentum is in this reaction is not conserved. So as you can see here, the experimental data associated with beta decay suggested the violation of conservation of energy principle, the conservation of linear momentum principle and the conservation of angular momentum principle. However, it did not violate the conservation of charge because electron is negatively charged, proton is positively charged and the neutron is neutral. It maintained the conservation of charge here. So what is happening? Except charge being conserved, the other important physical laws were seemingly violated in this kind of a beta decay reaction. It was first suggested by Wolfgang Pauli in 1931 that we can explain the seemingly violation of these important physical laws by introducing another particle in this given reaction. If we assume that there is another particle which is also emitted in this kind of a nuclear reaction, then we can explain why these violations are seen to happen. So it was first Wolfgang Pauli in 1931 who suggested this kind of a particle and later on Enrico Fermi in 1934 
who took this idea forward and they suggested that because charge conservation is not violated, charge is conserved in this reaction, so whatever this particle is should be uncharged in nature. It should also have a tiny mass because this particle is basically taking the total amount of energy from an electron and since electrons are very light, this kind of a particle should also be very tiny or have a very small rest mass. If this particle has a very small rest mass, then there is a possibility for preserving the energy conservation principle because the missing energy would then be taken off by this third particle. So electron will occupy some amount of the energy and the rest of the missing energy which was not explained till now will take off the remaining energy. So the missing energy is basically the energy of the third particle which is nothing but the expected kinetic energy minus the observed kinetic energy. Alright. So the missing energy is basically the expected kinetic energy minus the observed kinetic energy of the electron and it is taken off by this third particle. Also we can stop the violation of the conservation of linear momentum because if a third particle is involved then now it suddenly becomes a three body problem and let's suppose this third particle is going in a particular direction and we can lead it can satisfy the conservation of linear momentum principle. Also if another particle is involved here then based upon the conservation of angular momentum we can say that this particle should also have spin half. Only if this particle has spin half can we conserve the angular momentum principle. So you can predict that this particle should also have spin of half and since this has spin half then it should also be a fermion and if it is a fermion then it should also satisfy Fermi Dirac statistics. So this kind of a uncharged extremely tiny spin half particle which was initially suggested by Wolfgang Pauli and later on explored by Enrico Fermi was named as a neutrino. It was named as neutrino by Fermi which basically meant little neutral one. So this particle could theoretically stop the violation of these three conservation laws and explain why we were experimentally seeing this kind of results in the first place. Now it took a long time, almost 30 years, before this kind of a particle was actually experimentally discovered in the 1960s, thereby validating the theory provided by Fermi as to the existence of a new fundamental particle. This is in essence the neutrino hypothesis. The beta decay without an extra particle involved seemed to violate the energy conservation principle, the linear momentum principle and also the angular momentum principle. However, the only way to prevent the violations of these important physical laws was to predict the existence of a third particle which should be uncharged spin half and extremely tiny and has a small rest mass and that kind of a particle was later on discovered to be the neutrino experimentally. So this particle is basically given represented by the symbol of nu. Now this is this particle is associated with the emission of an electron. This is known as neutrino or sometimes also known as electron neutrino. There are two kinds of electron neutrinos which exist in nature. The matter version of the electron neutrino is simply known as electron neutrino or neutrino and the antimatter version of the electron neutrino is known as anti-electron neutrino or anti-neutrino and it is represented by this particular symbol. Since neutrinos are uncharged in nature, the distinction between a neutrino and an anti-neutrino is basically because of the direction of its spin and the angular momentum. So in a neutrino, the spin direction and the spin angular momentum direction are exactly in opposite directions, while in an anti-neutrino, the spin direction and the spin angular momentum directions are exactly in the same direction. That is how the distinction between neutrinos and anti-neutrinos are made. So as it turns out, whenever a negative beta decay process takes place where we end up having an emission of an electron this sort of a process is basically associated with the emission of an anti-electron neutrino while in those processes where a positron is emitted they are associated with emission of neutrinos so this is the neutrino hypothesis now let's move ahead to discussing the different kinds of beta decay processes that exist in nature so here we have the three common beta decay reactions which are usually seen in nature. The first one is a negative beta decay reaction which I just now discussed 
when there is an excess number of neutrons inside the nucleus the neutron can get converted to a proton and in that process an electron is emitted and an antimatter version of the neutrino is also emitted in the process now there are other kinds of beta decay reactions which is known as the positive beta decay reaction or positron emission in which a proton can get converted to a neutron. So when protons inside the nucleus are in excess, then that proton can get converted to a neutron. But now, instead of an electron, you have the antimatter version of an electron, which is the anti-electron or sometimes also known as the positron is emitted and a neutrino is emitted. What you need to remember is that whenever electrons are emitted along with an electron, an antimatter version of the neutrino is emitted. Whenever an anti-electron is emitted, a matter version of the neutrino is emitted. So anti-neutrinos and electrons are emitted together and neutrinos and anti-electrons are emitted together. This will help you in remembering which particles are involved in the nuclear reactions. So we have another kind of a nuclear decay process which is kind of similar to the positive beta decay process in the sense that a proton get, gets converted to a neutron but in this reaction instead of an anti-electron being emitted we have an electron being absorbed. So whenever we have large size nuclei where there is an excess number of protons then sometimes a nearby electron from the nearest electron orbit can be absorbed by the nucleus in which the proton will absorb an electron and become a neutron and emit a neutrino in the process. So this kind of a nuclear reaction is known as electron capture. This kind of a process is also associated with the creating a vacancy in the electron energy level which can now be occupied by some let's suppose higher energetic electron which will now suddenly jump from an excited state to a ground state and this will lead to the emission of an x-ray also in that particular process. Now here the positive beta decay and the electron capture are quite similar in the sense that a proton is getting converted to a neutron but the way it is happening is a little bit different. In the first case you have a positron being emitted, in the second case you have an electron being absorbed. So you can say that both these two nuclear reactions are sort of mirror reactions in a sense. In one a positron is emitted in the other an electron is being absorbed. So we can have these sort of a mirror reactions associated with respect to the neutrinos also. These kind of reactions are known as inverse beta decay processes. So let me explain how it happens. So for the first case in a negative beta decay, a neutron gets converted to a proton, leads to the emission of an electron and an antineutrino. What is going to be the mirror reaction associated with this? So the neutron will get converted to a proton and lead to the emission of an electron but in this case you have an absorption of the neutrino. So this is the antineutrino which is emitted in this case a neutrino is absorbed. So when a neutron absorbs a neutrino it leads to the creation of a proton and an electron in the process. Now what is the inverse beta decay associated with this reaction? So you have a proton which absorbs an anti-neutrino and leads to the creation of a neutron and a positron. So these kinds of processes in which neutrinos are absorbed to create some sort of a beta decay process are known as inverse beta decay processes. In fact, most of the time experimentally whenever neutrinos are detected in some experimental setup they usually involve the inverse beta decay processes. Whenever neutrinos come in contact with neutrons or protons they lead to certain beta decay reactions which can confirm the existence of neutrino particles there in the first place. So these are the different kinds of beta decay processes and the neutrino hypothesis that I just now discussed. So that is all for today's discussion. See you in the next video.